Hello and welcome to Discovering the Jewish Jesus with Rabbi Schneider. I'm your host, Dustin Roberts, and for the next 25 minutes, we're going to be looking at the subtleties of Messianic prophecy. Messianic prophecies are not just predictions about events that are going to take place in the future. They tell the truth of who the Messiah is, God's anointed, divine head, who is prophet, priest, and king. And today, Rabbi Schneider is going to explain how Jesus fulfilled the Messianic prophecies in the Old Testament and how he's coming back to fulfill the rest when he returns. This message, it comes from our series, Isaiah and Messianic Prophecy. So let's dive in. Here's Rabbi Schneider. What we're doing is we're looking into the Word of God, and I'm teaching how rich the Old Testament is with Messianic prophecy. I began to look with you in the Hebrew Bible, in what we call in Judaism, the Tanakh, or in Christianity, the Old Testament. We looked into the Old Testament, and we saw that God had a divine call on Israel's life. We proceeded by showing that Israel as a nation did not fully fulfill her calling. However, we pointed out that Israel has a divine representative. They have a head, and the head of Israel is none other than King Jesus himself that died with the sign above his head that said, Yeshua of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And so in order to understand messianic prophecy, we have to understand that the declarations that God made over the nation of Israel, although not fully fulfilled by the nation, are fulfilled in the head of the nation, King Jesus himself. It's important because in some nuances of messianic prophecy, we see, for example, Matthew taking scriptures that God spoke about Israel and applying them to Jesus. And if we don't understand what's going on, we'll scratch our head and wonder. Let me give you an example of this. I'm gonna take you now to the New Testament. We're gonna be looking at the book of Matthew, chapter number two, verses number 13 through 15. Hear the word of God. Now, when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Now, let me set the context here. Joseph and Mary had just given birth to their son, Jesus. As soon as Jesus was born, Herod was warned that a king had been born, that a Messiah had been born, and he was threatened. The same thing happened when Moses was born. Remember when Moses was born, Pharaoh panicked. He heard from the wise men and the magicians that a king had been born. And so he ordered the death of the newborn Hebrew children. Same thing is happening when Jesus is born. Why? Because listen, Jesus repeats the patterns in Israel's history because Jesus is Israel's divine head. And so the same patterns that Israel as a nation went through, we see Jesus living out in his life because he encompasses the nation. And so once again, even as Pharaoh ordered the death of the firstborn when Moses was born, the same thing is happening now when Jesus is born, Herod the king is ordering the death of the newborn Hebrew children. So it's in that context that we're reading. Let's look again at the scripture. Matthew chapter two, verse 13 through 15. Now, when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Now listen once again. Matthew was writing, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And then Matthew quotes this section from the Hebrew Bible. Out of Egypt, I called my son. So I want you to pause with me for a second. Jesus is taken to Egypt to avoid the slaughter of the newborn Hebrew children, just as it happened when Moses was born, because Jesus is repeating Israel's history. And now when that king, when Herod had died, when that king had died, what happens is the angel comes back to Joseph and appears to him and says, I want you to take the child back to Israel now, to fulfill, listen now, to fulfill 
what the prophet has spoken, and then he quotes the Hebrew prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Now, before we look at what section of scripture Matthew is quoting here when he says that the words of the prophet would be fulfilled out of Egypt, did I call my son? Before we look at what portion in the Hebrew Bible Matthew quoted, I wanna share this with you. When you and I think about prophecy, because remember, Matthew is saying he fulfilled the word of the prophecy here. When you and I generally think about prophecy, we're thinking about predictions, that there was a prediction made in the Old Testament that was fulfilled or will be fulfilled in the future. So generally speaking, when we think of prophecy, we think about a declaration being made that, listen, accurately foretells the future, a prophecy about the future. So for example, in the book of Daniel, we hear Daniel giving all these prophecies about the end times, what it's gonna be like on planet Earth during the end. Daniel said, I saw in a vision, and he said, and people were traveling to and fro, and knowledge had greatly increased. So Daniel was looking into the future, and he says, at the end of days, I see this happening. And sure enough, Daniel's prophecy is being fulfilled right now, all these years later, as people are traveling to and fro by airplane, and we're in the age of information technology. Knowledge has vastly increased all over the earth. Daniel talks about certain kings arising, these kings that will arise, world powers in the end times. So when we look at the prophecies of Daniel, we're looking for clues as to what's going to happen in the future. But what is interesting and mysterious is that Daniel uses prophecies in a completely different way. Rather than Matthew pulling out sections of scripture and showing how Jesus fulfilled the future prediction of that future, instead what Matthew does is he takes Israel's history he shows us how Jesus relived that history, and in reliving Israel's history, listen now, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. So the point that I'm making is that Matthew uses the word fulfilled, that a prophecy has been fulfilled in Jesus. Matthew uses that word many, many times, not to indicate that somebody in the Hebrew Bible predicted a future event, and Jesus fulfilled it, but rather what Matthew does oftentimes is show us how Jesus fulfilled something that God did in ancient Israel by repeating the pattern. So for example, once again, the scripture we just looked at, Matthew chapter two, verse 13 through 15, out of Egypt did I call my son. Joseph took Jesus back into Israel from Egypt where Jesus was kept in custody until Herod passed away. Now, where is this scripture, out of Egypt that I call my son, taken from? It's taken from the book of Hosea. And when we look into the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, here's what we read. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and here we go, and out of Egypt I called my son. So when we go to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, and see how Matthew used it, took it out of Hosea 11, 1, to say Jesus fulfilled it, the puzzling thing is that when we go to Hosea and we read that, we say to ourselves, well, that doesn't look like a prophecy because it doesn't look like Hosea is telling us that something is going to be happening in the future. It doesn't look like Hosea is prophesying a future prediction of what's going to happen. Instead, when we go to Hosea 11.1, 1, it just reads, when Israel was a youth, I loved them. Out of Egypt, I called my son. God is just speaking to Israel's past. It doesn't appear that God is predicting anything about Israel's future, and yet Matthew's saying that Jesus fulfilled it. How did Jesus fulfill it? Jesus fulfilled it, church beloved ones, because Jesus is Israel's divine representative, and the history that Israel went through is climaxed or all summed up or comes to its head in Jesus. Now, this is why when we go to the book of Luke, chapter 24, we find something taking place that really is a bit mysterious to us. What we find, beloved ones, church, in Luke 24 is this. Jesus' disciples were totally downcast. All they knew was that this one that they had left, 
everything to follow, King Jesus, who they thought was the Messiah, all they knew for sure was that he had been crucified. They got the report from Mary and the women that he had appeared to them, but they didn't know for sure. So they're walking on a road to Emmaus, a city about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. And once again, we have to put ourselves in these disciples' place as we go to Luke 24. They really are confused. I mean, they don't know what happened. They thought Jesus was going to lead Israel into freedom. Remember, even though the Jews were living in the land of Israel at the time of Jesus, they were still under, politically, the Roman people. So the Jewish people thought that the Messiah would free them from the Roman tyranny. And now Jesus had died, it hadn't happened. They didn't know what to think of it. They thought maybe that the thing that they believed was not true. So they're walking on the road to Emmaus in this mental state of confusion and discouragement. And as they're walking on the road, Jesus appears to them. But when Jesus appeared to them, he appeared to them in a physical form that they didn't recognize. In other words, he looked physically different to them than he looked to them when he was on earth with them. We have to remember Jesus is God in the flesh, so he can change forms, right? God is very fluid. We think, for example, the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, he appeared as a tongue of fire. When Jesus was baptized, he appeared as a dove. So God can appear any way he wants to. So it shouldn't be hard for us to imagine and understand that Jesus is able to appear to each one of us in whatever form he desires. So Jesus appears to these disciples of his as they're walking on the road to Emmaus in a form, a physical form that was to them just appeared that it was a stranger. And let's pick up now what happens as I begin to read from Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 25. Jesus comes up to me, said, he says to them after, you know, they were discouraged and speaking, you know, all this discouragement about everything. Jesus says this to him, oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. Then continue in verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And so in order for these apostles, these disciples to understand what was in the Old Testament about the Messiah, about the Christ, about Yeshua, about Jesus, in order for them to see it, listen, they had to supernaturally have their minds opened to come into a bigger space of understanding that they had previously been in. Remember, most Jews missed the Messiah's first coming because their understanding of messianic prophecy was very limited. And so what I've just shown you is that we need to understand messianic prophecy, not just in the sense of looking for something that a prophet predicted would happen in the future to happen, but we also need to understand messianic prophecy as being fulfilled in Jesus because Jesus, listen now, completes Israel's history by living out the same patterns. And so knowing that now, I want to begin to move towards the book of Isaiah. You're listening to Discovering the Jewish Jesus, and Rabbi will be right back. But first, did you know that you can receive real-time encouragement straight from Rabbi through text message? Visit discoveringthejewishjesus.com and click on the link that says Rabbi Text Me, or you can text the keyword Rabbi to the number 88777. Rabbi sends these special text messages as the Holy Spirit leads, and he looks forward to connecting with you real soon. Thank you for remembering that Discovering the Jewish Jesus is a listener-supported ministry. Rabbi Schneider's teachings are made possible through the generous gifts from people like you, who understand the importance of sharing the good news of Jesus' return. Because of you, we are changing lives all over the world. Give online by visiting discoveringthejewishjesus.com or call 800-777-7835. That's 800-777-7835. And now let's get back to Rabbi's message. As we begin to contemplate Isaiah and messianic prophecy in the book of Isaiah, I want you to understand who Isaiah was. First of all, Isaiah, as we know, is a prophet. 
A prophet is a spokesman for God. In the ancient biblical world, the nation of Israel was ruled by a hierarchy. And the hierarchy was the king, the prophets, and the priest. Now we know about the king. Israel cried out for a king. Eventually God gave them a king. We know David was one of the kings. So Israel was ruled by the kings, the prophets who were God's spokesmen, and the priest that mediated between the nation of Israel and God, primarily through sacrifices and worship. Isaiah was a unique prophet because many of the prophets, they would cry out in the streets and they were really radicals, where Isaiah was more sophisticated. He was a statesman. Isaiah actually was living in a very noble place and he served, listen now, under four different kings. The king that Isaiah first started under and the king that was in kingship when Isaiah got his call to be a prophet was King Uzziah. And we actually read about it in scripture in the sixth chapter of Isaiah's prophetic work. I wanna take you there now because this is really a very powerful portion of the word of God, how Isaiah encountered Father God in his power and in his glory. Listen to this section of scripture. Isaiah chapter six, verses number one through nine. Isaiah's recording. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of the host. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And here's Isaiah's call. Then I said, Here I am, send me. So after Isaiah has this incredible power encounter with Yahweh, the God of Israel, the Lord says to him, whom shall I send? And Isaiah responds, here I am, send me. When Isaiah received this call, once again, I want you to understand, he was different than many of the other prophets. He was a statesman and he was a scholar. He was very unique and his prophetic work The book of Isaiah is the longest prophetic work in the entire word of God in terms of the works of the prophets. 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah deal much about God's judgment of the nations and judgment of Israel. The last 27 chapters deal primarily with the Messiah, what he's going to look like, who he's going to be, where he's going to come from, what's his ministry going to be like, and the institution of the messianic age, what will happen on earth when Messiah fully exerts his lordship over the world. So what we're going to do, beloved ones, is we're going to dig down deep into the book of Isaiah. You're going to be fascinated by what you're seeing. Many of the scriptures that you've heard before that have kind of rolled off your back like water off a duck's back, they're going to hit your heart. And I'm telling you, you're going to go deeply grounded into scripture because of this series. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God abides forever. Even some of the scriptures, for example, that you think about during Christmas, like unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. You're going to see how many of these scriptures that you're familiar with actually come from Isaiah. And when you see them quoted again in the New Testament, you're going to be once again so rooted in the fact that Jesus is the Christ. He is the only way to God. And it's gonna help you, listen now, to be a bolder witness. Because when you and I are marked by God, 
We become bold. And oftentimes the reason people are not bold in their witness of Jesus is because, listen now, they're not fully convinced. They're not fully marked. But as I said to you earlier, beloved, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And I promise you this, God's Word is gonna go deep into your heart, slice it open by His divine electricity, and you're gonna become more excited about Jesus and more confident in who He is than ever before. You see, when you are able to put together the Old and New Testaments like a hand in a glove, you're gonna be fully equipped to go forward in your faith in spirit, listen, in truth, and in power. That's why I'm here. This is why the Lord has raised me up for such a time as this, to equip the church to understand the Jewish roots of her Christian faith. Because remember, Jesus said to the woman of Samaria, woman, salvation is from the Jews. So Father, we just ask you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation as we look deeply into your word. And I pray, Father, that in Messiah, Jew and Gentile will become one as we see that Jesus is the theme of scripture from the very beginning of the word of God to the very end of the word of God. Father, we just wanna tell you, thank you for Jesus. We love you today. And I speak this, Father, on behalf of all those that love you. God bless you, beloved ones, and shalom. Beloved, I've got a lot of joy in my heart right now because of this revelation that I've been able to bring you through this series, because I know that receiving the truth that I've been proclaiming, it revolutionized my life. It gave me such a confidence in God, such a boldness to be a witness, and I'm convinced that those of you that receive the truth that I've been sharing in this series, the same thing will happen in some measure for you. I wanna ask you, if you believe in me, if you believe that I'm an authentic preacher of the Word of God, I want to ask you to financially support me in this ministry. It cost us thousands and thousands of dollars, beloved, to broadcast and to reach the world with the gospel through discovering the Jewish Jesus, and we can only do it when God's people like you respond. So if you're being helped by my messages, I want to ask you to sell your finances into this ministry. The Bible says that we should financially support those ministries that are feeding us. I want to thank you today for your love and for your prayers and for your financial support. Thank you, God bless you, and shalom. And if God is calling you to support this ministry with a gift of any amount, would you go online right now and donate? You'll find us at discoveringthejewishjesus.com. And you can also give a gift of any amount by calling us at 800-777-7835. That's 800-777-7835. And you can also send a financial donation of any amount in the mail to Discovering the Jewish Jesus, P.O. Box 777, Blissfield, Michigan, 49228. And as a token of our appreciation for your generosity, we want to send you Rabbi Schneider's Message of the Month. It's available as a digital download as well. And then for anyone who becomes a new monthly partner, we'll send you an authentic, handcrafted shofar made right in Israel. And finally, when you reach out to us today, would you please let us know how we can be praying for you and your family? We lift every prayer request up to the Lord, and we would love to hear from you. Now here's Rabbi with the Aaronic Blessing. The words from the Aaronic Blessing in the book of Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, helps us to realize how good God is to you and I personally. So receive his blessing into your life, and then, beloved one, go bless somebody else in Jesus' name today. Yahweh <laughs> Vihunecha Isa Yahweh Penavelecha Veasem Lecha bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift you up with his countenance 
and the Lord give you, beloved one, his peace. God bless you, and shalom. Discovering the Jewish Jesus is a production of Shalom Ministries, and I'm your host, Dustin Roberts. Be sure to come back tomorrow when Rabbi Schneider explains how Isaiah's prophecy begins. That's coming up Wednesday on Discovering the Jewish Jesus.